We, we've been in a series and the title of it has been Original Design. Everybody say Original Design. Whenever we have an area in our lives that is either a struggle or, um, you know, or an area that we're like, okay, I need this. Wow, there's still candy on the floor down here. She threw some. Anybody want some more? Who wants more? There's, um, when, when, whenever we have an area that is a struggle or an area that we're like, okay, I know, God, that there's better than this in my life, the first place that we should start is in what we call original design. Since God is my creator, what does he say about that area? What does he specifically say about that area? Do I even know what God says or thinks from his word about that particular area? Have I gotten off track or maybe outside of his original design or healthy boundaries in our life? You know, my wife thinks that I drive too fast and I disagree with her, but she thinks that I drive too fast. And, um, and whenever we get on these mountain roads, they have these things called guardrails. And what the guardrails are for, or you get on treacherous roads, what the guardrails are for is to protect you from going over the cliff. How many of you are with me on that? And so in, in our lives, realize that God gives guardrails that he says about an area and that if we stay within those guardrails, we stay safe. But if we stay out, if we go outside those guardrails, what happens is, is it's a mess. It's a, it's a disaster. And so the first place that we should ever stop and look at is to say, okay, God, here's an area that I believe you have better for me in my life. Do I know what you say about this particular area? Area in my life because God's desire is to lift us. His desire is to bless us. His desire is that we sense him. But what it is, is we get to make that choice. Every day I get to make that choice. His favor is already on his ways and they're already blessed. Do you know that we don't have to ask God's ways to be blessed? They're already blessed. All I have to do is to say, okay, God, I'm going to go your way. And, and please understand me when I say this. I am not saying that if you're here and you're struggling or you have a challenge area right now in your life that you've done something wrong or somehow you're missing it. Please, that is not what I'm saying. Sometimes we just go through trying seasons in our life. How many of you have noticed that? How many of us right now can honestly say, I'm in a trying season? I just want to encourage you, God's with you in that season. And so it's just a trying season, but we must be open to him in his word, or it can go from a season to a lifestyle where it's like it was intended to be a season, but now it's turned into a lifestyle. And so we've got to be open to him. And so la- or the first week that we, ta- we got into this, we talked about God's original design for church. What he said church is, you know, today there's just a lot of hybrids and variables, and this is the way it's supposed to be, and this is the way church is supposed to function. But we got into, okay, God, what do you say? What does your word say about what church is? Is the way that it should function. And, and what we basically found out is God calls us all to come together corporately as a large body or a community. Jesus did it. But then we also found out that there's a second aspect of it that we're called to be in smaller community or small groups and have relationships with people right down where we live because we're relational by nature. And last week we talked about what we called two strong. Everybody say too strong. I think they put it up on the screen. Too strong. And the foundational scripture that we, uh, that we were building on last week, I want to read it again, but it's in Isaiah 40 verse 26 through verse 31. God said this. He said, look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. And how many of you are glad God's got a plan? He's got a plan. 
He says, oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see my troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say that God ignores your rights? Verse 28, have you, not, have you never heard, have you never understood the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth? He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. Now look at verse 29. Remember that the context is need. The context is, God, I'm in trouble. Lord, I feel like my rights are ignored. God, what's going on? And they're, they're saying this within themselves. Now look at what he says in verse 29. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Verse 30. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. What I want you to notice is God said he gives power to the weak, and then he begins to talk about two different types of strengths. The first is a natural strength in our life. I find this, that when I was younger, I could play football with my boys and play tackle, and I bounced back really quick. Now, if I play football, I find that I do not bounce back the way that I used to bounce back. How many of you are with me on that? And so what do I do? I don't play tackle football anymore with my boys. But the, but the thing is, is realize that natural has its limitations. There's nothing wrong with natural, but it has its limitations. And he talks here about youth who are a representative of the strongest, he said, they will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion or natural has its limitations. But look at what he said in verse 31. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. What I want you to notice is that God has promised a different type of strength that supersedes natural strength in our life. It is a totally, it is a, it is a totally different dimension. There's, and so when we talk about too strong, it's me recognizing that, you know what? I should be strong naturally. I should do everything I can to take care of myself. But realize that natural strength in my life has its limitations. It will not take me through certain things in my life. Jesus said it like this in John 6. He said, stop laboring for natural alone. That's what Jesus said. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan, he said, man can't live off natural or bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He was talking about two different types of strengths. Both of them are good, and I'm not minimizing natural, but natural alone has its limits. But God has a strength that transcends natural. And what I have noticed is this, is sometimes when we have natural problems in our life, God is saying, I want to show you a supernatural strength to overcome that natural problem, but we're locked into only natural, and God is saying, no, I want to show you how to be too strong in that particular area of your life. Natural strength is physical, and it's taking care of the natural, and we should. But then there's a strength that God supplies in our life, and it comes from the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah 40, he said it defies logic. Young men will fail. But you know what? If your strength is coming from me, when the young men are failing, you will still have strength to be able to move forward. It's supernatural in nature. And when we talk about this supernatural in nature, what I have noticed is this is that there's two, there's two different types of supernatural strength. There's one type that comes on us to do a particular task, and we see this in the Bible. 
You see it with Elijah. He outran uh, Ahab's chariots. It came on him to do a task. You see it with the disciples when they said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have. And they reached out and grabbed a guy that was crippled in his feet, and he stood up and walked. It was, it was on them for a particular task. Samson had the supernatural strength of God for a task. I personally believe that Samson was a guy that looked just like you and me. You say, why is that? Because if he was somebody that was nine foot tall and looked like a VW bus, how many of you know what I'm saying? You would never think he had a secret to his strength. The Philistines wouldn't be saying, what is the secret to his strength? But he looked natural, but when the strength of God came over him, they were like, this is God. There's got to be a secret to this. But then there's another one, another type of strength, and it's the infusing in my everyday life. It's the infusing of the strength of God in my life, in my everyday life. And to have it in a sustaining way, it is directly connected to my personal rhythms and my routines with God. God can give you strength. How many of you before, you did nothing and it was just like God came over you and you're like, oh yeah, how many of you know what I'm saying? I remember when I was uh, 17 years old and my mom to live in our house, you had to go to church. She told me that, and she's watching this, um, but I was the black sheep of the family. And I'm like, well, that's encouraging. How I many of you know when your mother tells you that? And, um, but she said, you know, you would just, and I would, I would go out, I was 17, and I'd go out and party in with my friends and everything, come home, two in the morning, hung over, but I knew that Sunday morning, as long as I went to church, then I had a free pass for the rest of the week to live at home and eat their food. How many of you are with me on that? And so I thought, well, I'll go, and, and I would go. I would go to church, and I would be hungover, sitting in the back, and I would start singing, and the presence of God would come over me, and the hangover would totally leave. I would sense the life of God, and I would be like, wow, this is incredible. Let me just tell you, it wasn't because of me. It was because of his goodness over my life, and it came over me at that point and in that season, and it just lifted my life. But to have it in a sustaining way is directly connected to my personal rhythms, my routine. Have I made room for God in my life? Is there room for him? When we talk about too strong defined, it's because the Holy Spirit is in me and it's not just me, but it's the two of us. And he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. When the earth was without form and void in Genesis 1, the Bible says that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, hovered over the face of the deep. And when God spoke, he created. It was the Holy Spirit that came over Mary when she was a virgin and caused her to conceive. It's the Holy Spirit that is the strength of God. I can overcome anything because he's in me and I've learned to cooperate with him and that even though naturally there's limitations, I'm too strong, not because of me, but because of him in me and I'm more than a match for anything going on in my life because he is he's the creator of everything we see. Are you with me today? It's not just getting it, but it's over, it's maintaining and increasing. One is physical based, natural strength, but when we talk about spiritual strength, it's relational based. It's my relationship with God. And I want to be clear I'm not saying that you're perfect. I'm not saying that you don't make mistakes because how many of you all know we all do? And if somebody around you acts like they don't make mistakes, you don't really want to be around them because they won't admit it when they make a mistake. How many of you know what I'm saying? Is it, but we all make mistakes. Whoa, I better get my, uh, my pack on. And what I want to do is I want to give what I'm going to call four non-negotiables in living too strong. Four non-negotiables. You know, if you read the Bible much, you come across this statement 
and it's and it's the it's the statement a fear of the Lord. How many of you remember that when you come across that fear of Old Testament, New Testament? You see that in the book of Acts. Um, when different things would happen, it would say, and a fear of the Lord came over the whole church. Now, whenever we hear the word fear in the English, it's primarily one-dimensional, and it's viewed very negatively. It's viewed, you know, I listened, this was years ago. Did you know that Oprah Winfrey was raised in the church? She got her first experience speaking in the church. She was raised in the church, but I heard her say this. She said, I was a Christian, until I began, I read in the Bible that God wants me to fear him. And the moment that I saw God wants me to fear him, I thought, who, why do I want a relationship with somebody who wants me to fear him? Now realize this, her view of fear was the English definition of the word fear. It wasn't the biblical definition of what the word fear is. If you look, when you take it into the Bible, it's way bigger than just the way that we see it. The word fear in the Bible means a high reverence. It means the highest regard. It means to honor, to hold in high esteem, to be in awe, to have a respect for God. It does include the very negative connotation of to be afraid, but it's from the perspective that I know that if I go against God, it's going to turn out very bad in my life. And so I'm afraid to go there because I know that God is right. His word is right. His truths lift. And so I don't want to go against him because I know that that will turn out very, very bad for my life. Are you with me? See, there's no substitute for a fear, a reverence, a high regard, an honor for God, a high esteem, or a high respect. Look at what it says in Proverbs 1, verse 7. It says, the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord, now look at this, is the beginning and the principle and choice part of knowledge, its starting point and its essence. But fools despise skillful and godly wisdom, instruction, and discipline. This is number one. Reverence for God and what he says is foundational to living in his strength. It is foundational. Notice what he said, the, the statement there. He said that a, a reverence or a fear of the Lord is the beginning and the principle or choice part of knowledge. See, first, it's a reverence for what God says in my life. A reverence for God takes over the steering wheel of my life. And what it does is it's learned and walking in the light of what I know. It's me learning his ways and then walking in the light of it. It's God, what you say to me is important to me, and God says, realize that my word is getting deeper now than just a superficial. It says that it is the choice part. Think about this for a moment. How many of you like steak? How many of you, what is the choicest part of a cow? Tenderloin, or another word, the filet. The prime, or not the prime rib, but the filet or the tenderloin. Notice that statement. God says that the choicest part is when we learn something, it gets a high level of reverence in our life. It's not just an opinion, but God's word is in a league all by itself. It's all by itself. God says the highest cut, the most valuable thing is that when you learn about me, there's an attitude on the inside of you that has reverence. It doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean, but as soon as we realize it, we quickly adjust. It's not this attitude of I can just do what I want and repent later. That is a lack of reverence. But we make mistakes in our life, and when we make a mistake, we simply 
and say, God, I realize I made a mistake. The term of fear of the Lord is a term that simply means I have a reverence and a high regard for God and what he says in his word for my life. It's the highest regard of anything else in my life. Proverbs 14, 22 says that when we have a fear of the Lord or a reverence for him, it steers us away from dumb decisions. It says in Proverbs 22, 4, that when we have a reverence for God, it leads us to riches, honor, and life. It's an attitude. A reverence for God sets my table with the options that I am going to eat from. And what a reverence for God does is it, it simply says, I will not let certain things on my table because my reverence for God has already set the table. Are you with me? I just won't let them on. A reverence for God is talked about in regard to my relationship with him over 300 times in the Bible. Over 300 times it's talked about. And many times it's connected to a promise or a blessing. Proverbs 10, 10 27 says, a fear of the Lord lengthens one's life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. See, without this, we won't sense God like he intends us to or sense his strength like we need to in our life. We just won't. And so that's number one. Number two is this, is time is a revealer and a developer in our lives. You know, time is a friend. It's not an enemy in our life. Jesus over and over referred to this process that God started at creation, and he defined it as seed time and harvest. He said everything's going to reproduce after its own kind. And so when we sow the right stuff, it just starts snowballing and going in the right direction. And the more time that goes down the tracks, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is just beyond God. You are really good. God told Noah after the flood that as long as the earth remains, this process is going to be in place. It's how God has set it up. Then Jesus told more parables about this process than any other process. And, and if you stop and you think about it, is that every great company, every great relationship, every great marriage, every great family, Every great endeavor is, comes from planting the right stuff, pulling out the wrong stuff, watering, fertilizing, weeding, growing, and harvesting. And what time does is it gives us the ability to do that in our life. All this is indicative of time. Look at what it says in Hebrews 6, 12. So don't allow your, your hearts to grow dull or to lose your enthusiasm, but follow the example of those who fully received what God has promised. Look at this, because of their strong faith and patient endurance. Two things, God, I got great faith. God says, how about patient endurance? Endurance is, we all know what that is, but patient endurance is my attitude while I'm enduring. It's my attitude while I'm enduring. Look at what it says in Galatians 6, verse 8 and 9. For he or she who sows to their own flesh or their lower nature and sensuality will from the flesh reap decay, ruin, and destruction. But the person who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For now look at this statement, in due time and at the appointed season, we shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. God is saying, realize that in our life, time is a revealer and time is a developer. Do you know that when I first got married to my wife, I studied marriage. I studied it read the Bible, all kinds of stuff. And then after I got married, I realized I was clueless. How many of you are with me on that? Okay, look, you should look shocked when I say that. You should look like, oh, I would have never guessed. I was clueless. But what it was is time revealed that in my life. Beforehand, I would have been like, I got this down. 
before we had kids. I studied kids. I remember I was a youth pastor, and I gave, I, we had no children, and parents would come to me for advice for their children. <laughs> they would ask me, I wish I could go back. How many of you are with me on that? Just throw it all in the trash. How many, unless it was a scripture, just throw it all in the trash. How many of you know? It was, but what happened is, is time was a revealer. It revealed and it developed me in that area. I'm going to give you the third thing, but before I do, I want to, you know, I want to give you the history of Joshua and Caleb when they came out of Egypt. If you study and you can go back and look in like Numbers 12, 13, 14, and you can read the story, but they came out of Egypt and they were young men. And the Bible says that after God got, got the children of Israel out of Egypt and they went into the, uh, the promised land, he opened up the Red Sea and they went through on dry ground and they're going in to the promised land, is that Moses picks 12 people to go in and spy out the promised land and then bring back a report to them of what it's like. And is it what God said it basically was? And the Bible tells us that they go in and they come back and that 10 of the 12 came back with what God, God called an evil report. It was that, yeah, the promises were there, but there's giants, there's problems, there's stuff in the land. But two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said that we are well able. We can go in and we can take this land. And so you find that they basically, Joshua and Caleb couldn't inherit the promise because all of the people joined the 10. And so so they had to wait for over 40 years to enter into what God had for their lives. How many of you know that if somebody caused you to have to wait over 40 years, you would get a little irritated? How many of you are with me on that? It'd be like, hey, let's me and you go out around the mountain and have a conversation. It's, it's, and, and so Joshua is there. Well, now this is nearly, it's 45 years later and Joshua 14 verse 6 through verse 12 says this, a delegation from the tribe of Judah led by Caleb, the son of Jephna, there he is, there's Caleb, the Kinzite, came to Joshua at Gilgal. Caleb said to Joshua, now look at this statement, and I'm going to highlight it each time he says this, remember what the Lord said to Moses. He's referring to a promise, the man of God about you and me when we were at Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Canish Barnea to explore the land of Canaan, and I returned and gave an honest report. But my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord, my God. So that day, Moses, now look at, here it is, solemnly promised me the land of Canaan on which you were walking will be your great, your grant of land and that your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. Verse 10. Now, as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well. Here it is. As he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise. Even while, in, even while in Israel wandered in the wilderness, today I am 85 years old. I am as strong now as I won once when Moses sent me on that journey. And I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. Verse 12. So give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that that as the scouts we found the descendants of Anak living in the great walled towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land just as the Lord said. What I want you to notice is this, is what Caleb remembered was the promise of God. What Caleb remembered for 45 years is what God had said to him. What kept him strong, what kept him in a place, 
Now, I don't know about you, but he said, I am as strong today as I was 45 years earlier. He's 85 years old, and he remembered, and he continually fed on it to this day. This is number three. Knowing what God has promised in my life is foundational to biblical strength. I've got to know what God has promised in my life. What has God promised in your area of need? What has God promised you over your children? What has God promised you over your health? What has God promised you over your future? And what you see is there was a delay, but he wouldn't let go of the promise of God. And it kept him strong all the way through to this day. And I believe today that God is saying, I want to make you too strong, but do you remember my promises over your life? Because they'll stabilize you. What God God has said in his word about my life and in my area of need. Whose report do I believe? I will always be presented with options, but whose report do I believe? Because what I believe can be seen in my actions. My will will always align with what I believe and my actions will go in that direction. Amen? Do I have time for one more? Really quick. God's strength in me is a partnership, meaning I have a part, and it's not just up to him. It is not just up to God. It's a partnership. I've got to believe that where I'm weak, he wants to display his strength. He wants to. It's a partnership. I've got a part in it. I'm going to close, and I want to tell you a story. You know, when our kids, and they're all grown now, but when our kids, we were looking, and we, um, my wife's incredible, but we had four kids, five and under, at one point. And um, we waited three years before we had kids, and then we're like, ready, set, go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we had boo-boo, and we're like, we're done. And we had four kids, five and under. And so when they were like 13-ish or around there, we're like, oh my gosh, they're all going to need cars. How many of you know what I'm saying? It's like they're all going to need cars. And so we talked and we came up with a plan and we basically said, well, the goal is, is to prepare them to launch. The goal is not that they depend on us, but that they partner. And so we said to our kids, we said that whatever you raise, we will match it when you want to get a car, whatever you raise. So if you raise 20 bucks, we'll give you another 20. If you raise 100 bucks, we'll give you another 100. You'll have 200 for your first car. If you raise 1,000, we'll give you 1,000. If you raise 10,000, God forbid, I hope they don't do this. How many of you know what I'm saying? We will give you $10,000. And so we we're, we're, we were grateful. And, and so they, they, they raised their money and, and you know, we, we would, we would match it. Please, I'm not saying for you to do it. I'm just saying that's what we did. We just looked and said, this is what we feel like would, would, would um, equip them, but also we would help them. And so they got their driver's license and, and, um, and, and, and I remember we, we also said though, they said, we said, but you know, if you don't raise anything, then what you get is what's left over. And what's left over is usually a beater from one of the older kids. How many of you know what I'm saying? It's it, one that has been hit, wrecked, crashed, rusted, might smoke, windows might work, but it will get you from point A to point B. How many of you know what I'm saying? Well, one of my kids came to me and they had, um, they, they, they didn't save much. And so they got a beater and <laughs> they came to me and they were irritated. They were mad. And they said, you know, you could get me a nicer car. That's what they said. They said, you could get me a nicer car. Then, I mean, look at the one I'm driving. And I have to admit, how many of you know what I'm saying? It was, it was rough. It was rough. And, and I remember, and I said, you know, you're probably right. I could, but what would that teach you long-term in your life? What would that teach you? And they didn't get it at first, but they later came to me and they said, you know what? I realize now you were right back there by the way that you did that, 
but I didn't like it at the time. And I think in our lives sometimes, God is saying, I want to partner with you, but you're going to need to do your part. I'm not going to do it all. You talk, you talk like you want my strength. You talk like you want to walk close with me. And I know that you do. I know that that's in your heart. But it must translate into your decisions. It must translate into your choices. I said I was closing after that story, but this is my second closing, and it's in Joshua. I just want to read a scripture. I like to give the Bible anytime we come together and lay down a principle. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 through verse 9. God said, be strong, okay, and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning to the right or to the left. Now look at this then you will be successful in everything you do. I'm going to say it like this. God said, be strong and courageous in your reverence for what I say. Fear the Lord in your reverence for what I say. That was number one. He said, I want you to be strong and courageous, and there's going to be a reward. Verse eight, study this book of instruction continually. Great question. How often is continually? How many of us eat continually? Just be honest. There's a rhythm to your eating. How many of you know what I'm saying? Okay, the rest, you have no rhythm. How, I could go on. How many of us go to the bathroom? Con no, I better not say that. He said, study this book of instruction continually. And when you study it, he said, meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Now here it is, here's the promise. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. Look at the statement, God said, be strong and courageous in hunger and humility, and there's a reward on the other side. Verse nine, this is my command. Here it is again, be strong and courageous do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is the third thing, strong and courageous when facing fear or discouragement, and there's a reward in your life. I don't think it is an accident, and you, if you look at this order, is the first to deal with my inside life, and the last one deals with Satan's attacks on the outside of my life. God said, if you will get too strong on the inside with cooperating with me, he said, this third one will flow. It will flow and you will be strong and courageous and there's a reward. See, everything was laid out for Joshua. It was all promised. God said, you're gonna lead them in. But then God stops and in verse seven, eight, in nine is he said, I need you to be strong and courageous in your reverence for what I say. And there's a reward. I need you to be strong and I need you to be courageous in your hunger and in your humility that no matter how blessed you are, it will never touch your hunger and your humility toward me. And I want you to be strong and courageous when you're facing fear and discouragement and and I'll have a reward for you on the other side. See, this notion of being strong and courageous is easy. This notion of being strong and courageous is convenient. This notion of being strong and courageous and being too strong is just going to happen. It is not real. But when we stop and we say, God, I realize that you want me to be too strong. Your Holy Spirit in me in infusing me with inner strength so that when I go through things, it is not just my strength. I'm doing the natural that I know, but it is your presence in me that gives me the oomph that is greater than anything natural. And young people around me will be fallen. Young people around me will be tapped out. Young people around me will be tapping the mat. But because you're in me, I can do anything. I can overcome anything 
because it's you in me. It is not a mystical secret. It is not that I have a couple chosen few, but it's because you have chosen to realize that to be strong in me is a partnership that is every single day shows up in your rhythms, your routines, and your consistency. And then you will see my presence and my power and my strength when you're going through things in life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand up.